Dr. Benedict, thank you so much for being here with us today. Can you talk to us a little bit about your work? Let's start there. Um, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm a clinical neuropsychologist and a professor in neurology. Uh, my job in the area of MS neurology is to help clinicians, help psychologists, and help researchers understand uh, the mental or psychological phenomena that patients experience. MS is a disease that is affecting the brain, and it's only natural that they would uh, have problems with mental functioning in many different ways, and indeed they do. MS patients have a very high frequency of depression. Um, they have a high frequency of cognitive disorders, particularly the ability to think quickly and to remember and learn new things. And they also, on occasion, will have problems with personality changes and behavioral dysregulation. Okay. All of this is related to uh, various aspects of the brain disease of multiple sclerosis. So then, how are you helping the clinicians? I mean, are you doing this through your research? Are you actively advocating various protocols for managing MS patients psychologically? Yes, to both of those questions. And also, in the clinic, I, I do that quite a bit as well. So I see patients as, uh, and advise neurologists about treatment avenues for the particular psychological problems that patients may have. And in the research area, my job is to uh, narrow the scope of potential measures of, uh, of this area uh, to identify uh, those tests or outcome measures that are likely to be accepted by regulatory agencies and likely to have meaning uh, if their positive result is achieved with the trial. So how do you ascertain whether or not a, a patient diagnosed with MS either is having or beginning to have some of these psychological implications of the disease? Is there a way to sort of screen it so that you can catch it early on? Yes, there is. Uh, uh, the most um, painstaking or, or uh, uh, costly approach is to actually do a neuropsychological examination of the patient. This can take sometimes even up to several hours long, so we don't want to uh, burden clinics or burden patients with having every patient seen in that way. But there, um, by uh, asking patients targeted questions about uh, their current status and particularly asking carers or observers about it, their status, you can often screen for uh, potential problems and then take those patients to a, a fuller examination. There's also ways of doing brief measures of assessment that you can repeat with some frequency. So you can kind of monitor patients with a few brief tests when they come in for their clinic visits. So there are lots of ways to do that. Um, uh, and indeed, we try to do that. And how do you manage it once the symptoms have already um, exhibited themselves in a patient? If they perhaps didn't catch them early enough on or um, they came on suddenly, is it something that can be managed with medication or are you already in a position where you don't want to be medicating them so much because of the other symptoms that they're dealing with? Um, this is an area of very, very active investigation right now. Uh, there, is no, there are no indicated medications based on research for this particular problem, but it hasn't kept uh, many a clinician from trying to use medications. And if you look at the publications on what they call symptomatic therapies for cognitive impairment, um, there are some hints in those studies that can help guide some clinical decision making about what you may or may not try with a patient. And we are continuing to do new research on drugs such as denepazil or uh, <clears throat> Adderall or L-amphetamine, Lisdexamphetamine, Dalpamperdine. There are many candidate measures out there that may stimulate the brain to help the brain work qu more quickly or help with memory. So you look at the studies that were positive, the studies that were negative, and while there's not enough consistency to say that drug A is definitely going to help patients, uh, by looking at that literature carefully, I think clinicians can be a bit more informed about what they may experimentally try with patients and not. Also, 
knowing that there's a cognitive impairment can be very helpful to patients, counselors, psychologists, because um, there's no wheelchair for a cognitive impairment, but there are um, ways of coping with the problem that can be very important to help uh, keeping patients in the workforce or helping them to maintain a reasonable quality of life. Just ignoring it actually may work for a few, but most patients that will not help. And then finally, I should mention that identifying the cognitive changes is an important monitoring tool for neurology clinicians as they are making decisions about disease-modifying therapies. So if a patient's getting worse, if they're continuing to develop ambulation problems and they're on the same disease-modifying therapy, some consideration is made to changing the medication perhaps the same thing goes for cognition. If the patient is deteriorating cognitively, that's of concern to the clinician, and they uh, use that in making their decisions about medical therapy. Okay. And two of the um, elements that are mentioned in your, your write-up that you submitted, the NINS Common Data Elements Workgroup, can you tell us what that is? <clears throat> the NINDS is um, one of the institutes at the NIH. Um, it's a neurologic institute, and um, they have uh, begun a project called Common Data Elements, which is their effort to ensure that certain data points are included in virtually all studies that are funded by them within a particular disease entity. This serves the public because that information is part of uh, the public domain because it's been funded by the public. So. If you wanted to do an analysis, say, of uh, EDSS over the last 10 years and all the studies funded by the NIH, we ought to be able to do that because we paid for it. EDSS would be a common data element. Are there other common data elements that we should also consider? That is the question that was put before a panel of some 60 or so people. And we were divvied up into our areas of expertise. I had the honor of chairing the cognition section of that. And um, we did propose that um, a test should be part of the common data elements. And the second component that you mentioned here is the International Cognitive Assessment for MS, BICAMS. Can you tell us a little yes, bit about that? Yes, that's a similar group. It's on an international basis. It wasn't funded by a um, institute like NIH. Um, but it's an interest group uh, on an international basis of addressing the question, is there something that we can get everyone to do worldwide that's very brief and basic so that we can begin to collect data points across the world on a similar monitoring tool for MS patients? And that was, that's the task of that group. And we have been, we've had some success. We've published one paper with a recommendation and there are about seven international groups. There's one in Iran, one in Sweden, one in uh, Argentina, uh, Czech, uh, the Czech Republic, and probably I'm forgetting a few, I think one in France. So there's efforts to validate this approach all around the world. And um, once that's done, we can, we can proceed forward with collecting these data. And I know we've been talking here about MS, but are you looking at this in terms of the implications of other neurovascular diseases as well? I'm not personally. Um, the principles that I talked about today in my talk and that we're speaking about apply to all neurologic diseases that involve the brain. And um, uh, there's quite a bit of overlap with some of the cognitive problems that MS patients have and Parkinson's disease patients have, and to a somewhat lesser degree, Alzheimer's disease patients, normal aging as well. So <clears throat> um, the principles apply. There are tests that are maybe potentially more useful in those diseases than what we talked about in MS, and there's probably some overlap also. So what's next then? I know you said that you know, future work needs to be done. What exactly does that mean? What, what will happen? Um, well, the cognitive outcomes that we've talked about here today uh, will need to be, in my view, applied to future work with CCSVI. I think it's an important area that needs to be accounted for in their clinical trial work. Um, 
And we are constantly in, in the uh, business, so to speak, of uh, bettering, creating new tests, new metrics that can be more easily applied and more sensitive and more reliable. So this is work that's ongoing. Uh, uh, we just published a recent paper on the reliability of different versions of a, one particular test. And this is part of what we do as neuropsychologists. So an interesting point that you made was the funding of um, the NINDS study by NIH and mm -hmm. you know the, the international outlook of BICAMS. You seem to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, being in this niche area that you are, you're actually getting funding and validation. You're somewhat unique in that in the world of CCSVI, aren't you? Um, I don't know. To tell you the truth, I don't know what I'm. I'm not as um, close to the CCSVI world as I would need to be to really answer that. So how is it that you're interrelated to CCSVI? Can you explain the connection? Well, I, I collaborate with uh, Robert Zabadinov, and he's a CCSVI investigator. And um, we have, uh, he, he's utilized my expertise uh, when he's interested in cognitive outcome measures. So we have a study that we're doing now and using cognitive outcomes as part of that study. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, what have I missed asking you, Dr. Benedict, that you feel is important for people mm -hmm. to understand? Not that I can think of. Okay, great. Yeah, Thank you very so. much. All right.